All right, you guys ready for a message this morning? I am excited to preach. Some series, I'm just telling you, pastors get a little extra juice. You know what I'm saying? And worship series is one of them. If you're just joining us today, we are in week number two of a series called Raise a Hallelujah, where we're talking about not just a, building a culture of worship in our, our church, but also a culture of worship inside of each one of our lives. And just kind of asking, how do we do this? How do we worship God with everything that we are on Sunday mornings, beyond Sunday mornings? Where do our expectations need to be? How do we participate in worship? How do we integrate that into our lives and all of that kind of stuff? So as we dive into this today, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 9. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and open those up. If you're dialed in at home, you can dial in to Luke chapter 9 as well. I'm going to read uh, verses 28 through 35. And we're going to talk a little bit about the dynamic of worship and participating in it as we get into this today. If you're ready for the scripture, go ahead and say, yeah. Yeah. Let's dive in. Luke 9, starting in verse 28, says this. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying... The appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see. They were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. And when they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, "Uh, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and hey, one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. My message title today that I'm taking is very, very simple. Participation. (laughs) Participation. Let's talk about it. We're not handing out trophies. We're talking about worship and we're going to get into it. Let's say a prayer and then we'll be on our way. Jesus, thank you so much for the example that you set for your disciples, that you allow us to even get a glimpse of your glory is beyond our comprehension. So as we travel with you up the mountain today, would you show that to us again? And would you show us, like you showed Peter, what a proper response to that is? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I've, been, I've been working out at the gym that I work at, Lifetime Fitness, uh, that I work out at. Uh, it's, uh, it, I've been doing this now for like about two years with some pretty consistent regularity. Now, I've had a gym membership for many years. <laughs> but working out consistently, like doing it consistently, more like two years, coming up on two years. And well, I do, here's the thing. While I like how working out makes me feel physically... Like, I will also tell you to not get it twisted. That doesn't mean I love doing it, okay? Don't, don't, don't get all romantic about it. Most of the time, I'm here to get this over with. You know what I'm saying? I just want to get in, get out, get the job done. Uh, so when I get in and I'm doing my workout in the gym, I'm, I'm one of those, like, I've got the hat pulled low. I've got the music and the headphones pounding real loud. And I'm just kind of grinding it out. I'm much more, when it comes to workouts, of the we're not here for a long time, we're here for a good time. You know what I'm saying? So let's get this done. A good time is a short time. So when I go into the gym, I I wouldn't say that I avoid people. I wouldn't say that I'm I'm antisocial by any means, but I'm not here to post on Instagram between sets either. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm I'm also not here to like go around and talk to everybody in the room. Let's get this done with and let's move on with life. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I'm in the gym and I'm starting a shoulder workout. And I'm doing this lift where you take some lighter weights and you just, you just kind of bring them up out here like this. You bring them out here like this and then down. 
That's all I'm doing. And I'm doing, you, you get some lighter weight and you do that 12 to 15 times, four to five sets. It will set your shoulders on fire, y'all. It's unbelievable. It's such a good workout. It's just awesome. So I'm doing this thing and out of the corner of my eye, I start seeing that there's a guy that's kind of watching me as I'm working out. So I just, you know, I'm getting dialed in. No, 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 don't get distracted. No social is it. We're just here to get this done. So, you know, kind of pulled the hat down a little bit more. Kind of eye of the tiger rock. Let's go. Let's get this done. So I did a second set. The guy's still watching me. I did a third set. And I notice he's watching me, but he's a little closer to me this time. And I'm, I'm, I can feel it coming. That as I drop the weights on the ground, I feel a little <laughs> tap on the shoulder. Right? The guy, the guy, he's wanting to talk to me. So I pulled my, 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 uh, my headphones back and I was like, hey, what's up? And, he, and this is what he said, no joke. He said, hey man, I just wanted to tell you that your shoulders are looking like boulders up there as you're doing that stuff. I, and then he said, I've been trying to work on my shoulders and it's not going so well. Like I feel real scrawny and I haven't been able to get the size that you got. Can you show me how you're doing this thing that you're doing? Like, what are you doing up here with this movement? What is that all about? Is it, is it the front of the shoulder that you're working? What are you doing? Well, <laughs> exactly. My attitude changed real quick. I got real social. Right? All of a sudden, real, real shocker, right? I spend about five or 10 minutes with this guy and I'm just showing him the form and the movement. And we talked about the three heads of the shoulder and how you work each one of them and how you can eat to kind of gain muscle mass. And we talked about all this kind of stuff. And I'm not, I'm not sharing this story to paint myself in a certain kind of light. Okay? I hope you understand that. The reason that I share this is that when I started lifting consistently a couple of years ago, I'm just going to tell you, going to the gym was real hard for me. It was real hard because I had reached a point in my life where I was just incredibly self-conscious of my situation. You know what, I, you know what I'm saying? Anybody, is it, anybody can relate to that? Little self-conscious of what you've got going on? Like, it was hard for me to even really want to go. Now, I'm happy to report that that was nearly two years and almost 75 pounds ago. So I'm feeling a lot better these days. But when I started, when I started, man alive, going to the gym was more like a total, total seriousness. Friday nights, 8 p.m., only two people in the weight room, me and one other single dad in the room, because neither of us have anything going on on a Friday night. And we're both making eye contact with each other like, I see you, brother. I see what you're doing. You know, sometimes you need to do that because we got to keep each other going. We got to keep each other encouraged here a little bit. We're both feeling like we're maybe on the struggle bus a little bit. Now, listen, that situation is real, but you know, sometimes you got you to gotta make sure that you're able to grind it out when no one else is looking and getting that encouragement that you need. So that's why when I got this compliment from this guy in the gym, get that tap on the shoulder, it meant a lot to me. And the reason that it did is because, listen, I do not have the shoulders of a bodybuilder by any means, okay? But what I do have, I've worked hard for. And that's the thing about working out, man. Don't ever judge people at the gym. Don't ever judge people at the gym. You don't know where their journey's been. And you don't know where they started either. That'd actually be a good sermon title, wouldn't it? You don't know where I started, right? You know, I may not be where I want to be. But I'm not where I could be, and I'm not where I would be, and I'm not where I should be before he found me. So I'm not where I start. Anybody glad you're not where you started this morning? I'm glad. Because listen, that's just it. Everybody starts somewhere. You have to start somewhere. And if you don't do what my new friend did, like if you don't ask questions of people who are a little bit ahead of the game than you, nobody ever shows you how, nobody ever explains it to you, nobody ever teaches you how to do it, or if the people who do know how to do it are so busy looking at themselves in the mirror while they're doing it that they never teach anybody else, then nobody's ever going to learn anything, right? Listen, I don't have a lot of bodybuilder knowledge, okay? I don't. I am not the Arnold Schwarzenegger encyclopedia 
of how to build a body, okay? And I have the DNA of a German potato farmer. That, that's just the reality. But I am happy to help someone learn something that I've learned that actually feels really good to do. So, when we're talking about the subject of worship, okay, and we read a passage like the one we just read about, where Peter is witnessing the transfiguration of Jesus, and then he's responding with his kind of silly questions, where even Luke is telling his readers, right, like, yeah, he's weird. We don't know what to do with him. He says things he shouldn't say. He does it all the time. He's got a big mouth. That's just old loud mouth Peter, right? That's just big mouth Peter doing stupid Peter things once again. It's easy to make fun of him in the moment, but we never talk about the fact that there were two other disciples with him. Neither one of them had the guts to ask a question. Neither one of them spoke up about anything. Like, hey, Jesus, we just witnessed something incredible. How should we respond to this? Hey, Jesus, what should we do next? Jesus, what's appropriate here? What should our response to you look like? If we see your glory, if it's reflected, if it's around, if we get a sense of the tradition of the faith and where you want us to go, what do you want us doing with this? How do you want us to respond to this? Now, I didn't hear any other disciples asking these questions, did you? So Peter is at least up here saying, Jesus, what should our response look like in the church? Come on, somebody. How do we expect anybody to know how to respond to God and worship if nobody ever explains it to them or shows it to them? So today, that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to talk about participation in worship, and Peter's going to help us get real practical in breaking down the movements of how we participate in weekend worship services so all of us can get a little bit healthier around this stuff. Would that be helpful to anybody today? I think it'd be really helpful to us as a church. I think it'd be really helpful in each one of our lives. So we're going to start here. And this is the first thing you've got to understand about responding to God's glory in worship. This is a great time to grab those notes that you got, those message notes, got them on the way in. Write some stuff down, take it with you into your week, okay? First thing is this, that when it comes to worship, when you go through the motions, you miss all the good stuff. When you're just uh, going through the motions, just here to be here, you miss all the good stuff. Look what it says in verse 31. This is quite a contrasty picture. They were glorious to see, meaning the, the, the dead people who are there talking to Jesus. And they're speaking about his exodus from this world, which is about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had stood up and took notes. Now what'd they do? What'd they do? They fell asleep. They fell asleep. So, Get this picture in your mind now. Jesus and two dead people, Moses and Elijah, are having a conversation about how and why Jesus is going to exodus from this world, how and why Jesus has come to save the world, why he has to die, what's going to happen in Jerusalem, all that kind of stuff. So we've got this extraordinary event with the Son of God and and, and like two force ghosts who appeared, okay? Okay? And they're talking about the subject of why Jesus is going to be crucified. What's happening here as he's trying to save the world. There is literally no other conversation on the planet that is as important or as interesting or as relevant as what these guys are talking about right now with this insane gathering of people. Listening to this conversation could have saved Peter and it could have saved the disciples from so much other stuff that was about to happen in the coming days. But what's Peter doing? He's sleeping. He is sleeping. And in the middle of all that, the glory of God is being revealed all around him. And Peter, James, and John, Jesus' closest friends, are sleeping through One of the moments of his greatest glory. Now, if Jesus' closest friends are capable of sleepwalking through an experience like that, 
do you think you might be capable of sleepwalking through a Sunday morning at church in the middle of a Minnesota summer? Mm Mm-hmm. Right? Like, you ever come to church and you're physically present but mentally asleep? Like, just not there today? Maybe you're distracted. Maybe you're checked out. Maybe you're looking forward to that last song being over. Maybe you're looking forward to the pastor shutting up. I mean, just you ever feel like that? Don't answer that last one. Okay? But of course you have. I feel that way too sometimes. Everybody has felt this way. So last week we talked about the fact that one of the first problems in worship culture in church is that most people come to church really not expecting that Sunday afternoon is going to look or feel any different than Sunday morning because we just don't think that the worship service, if we're honest with ourselves, is going to really rock our worlds that, that big and heavy about all of this kind of stuff like Jesus wants to change my life. We just don't see it or expect it. So we don't see worship as something where it's going to really be that big of a game changer. And when that happens, hear me on this now, when that happens, it gets really, really, really easy to just show up at the worship service and go through the motions because we just don't expect much from it. So we sleepwalk through it. And by sleepwalk through it, specifically what I mean is we don't prepare for it. We don't invite people to come with us. We don't go to bed a little earlier on Saturday night because we've got to get up on Sunday morning. We don't get together and act like people who feel like, hey, we're about to have an encounter on Sunday morning together with the God of the universe. We need to get up early for that. Like we, we, we need to get excited When the doors of that worship center open up and you see that countdown, we ought to be right there and just focused and excited and ready to dive right in. We should actually do things like, I don't know, sing when the music is starting. We should do that, right? We should listen to God's word and here's here's an idea, do what it says. Do what it says. We've got to get into that mindset a little bit that this is the most important and the most supernatural encounter you're going to have this week. Like, this is a really big deal. What's happening in here? Most of us, if we're honest, that's just not our pregame of our worship experience, is it? It's, It's just not. Why do you think that so many gym memberships start in January but are finished by March? Right? is because if people actually went to the gym at all in those three months, like they probably were doing stuff that they were used to doing 30 years ago when they were in high school and played a sport for a minute, right? And, or, or they kind of came in and they jogged one day or maybe, you know, stopped at the cafe and went on to the, you know, maybe sit in the pool or the sauna. That's healthy, sauna sweat, I sweated, it counts, right? We get into this <clears throat> kind of mindset, but then what happens is that we kind of get in here, we spaz out for a little while, we don't, we don't train, we try, and as a result, we end up shocked when stuff doesn't end up looking or feeling the way we thought it was going to look or feel, and, and so they quit. People do the same thing with God and worship. We've got to start recognizing worship for what it is. It is you responding to and accessing and downloading and witnessing to something about a supernatural revelation that is trying to break into your life. We need to be a church. We need to be that's chomping at the bit to get into this space together. Like, do you understand the kind of experience we're about to have? Do you understand who's here with us right now? In this room, do you understand that Jesus is present and the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you and break into your life and invade your insecurities and talk to your depression and build you up where you're feeling weak? Do you understand that? That the God of the universe who made you, who gave you life, who gave you breath, who gave you purpose, that he's really here and that he wants something for you in this space. If you really believe that, then why is it so easy to put our worship on autopilot? Why is it so easy 
for us in America right now as a country to come to church twice a month and be considered a regular church attender, right? If I go to the gym two times a month, should I expect anything good to happen? No. Sorry, it just doesn't work like that. You could be having an encounter with God that will turn your world completely around instead of the encounter you're having with your spiritual my pillow. Right? <laughs> Is that the best we have to offer in worship? We think that Jesus should just be happy we showed up. The pastor's lucky I showed up at all. It's the middle of summer, man. What'd you expect from me? Because I come on, it's it's just church. It's just faith. It's, just, it's all kind of like fake anyway, right? It's just a big show anyway. So I'll go through the motions, whatever. Stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. Uh, I'll do it. But it's just church. Do you see what low expectations do? They put you to spiritual sleep. We need to be better than that in our life in the church. And it leads me to the second piece that we learned from Peter, that worship is about giving, not getting. Participation means you're bringing your best. You're bringing your best. So I can't sleepwalk through it. I've got to bring my best. Peter finally gets the revelation of what's happening in front of him. He kind of comes to it a little bit. He's like, oh my gosh, that's pretty, that's pretty weird. Jesus, what can I do? How do you want me to respond? Like, that's a big deal. And when Peter realizes what he's, that he's witnessing something pretty special, up on the mountain, his questions are about building a shelter or building a, a, like, a, like a memorial up there on the mountain. Now, you need to understand what Peter, <clears throat> what he's asking, okay? He's asking Jesus, okay, now that I'm awake, now that I'm here, now that I've snapped out of it a little bit, how should I respond in worship? What do you want from us here? I want to read you a passage from the book of Malachi where God actually tells his people exactly what he wants from them in worship and really, really frankly, some of the things he doesn't want in worship. Okay, this is, this, is a, this is what the prophet Malachi wrote in Malachi 1. Now listen, this is a little bit of a longer passage, but I, I, I want you to get in on this here because Malachi is giving us some insights that I think are valuable for us today. So this is Malachi chapter 1, and I'm starting in verse 6, where it says, the Lord of heaven's armies says to the priests, that's important. Why? Because he's talking to the professional worshipers, okay? These are the pros, people who do it for a living. A son honors his father, and a servant respects his master. If I'm your father and master, where are the honor and respect I deserve? You've shown contempt for my name. But you ask, well, how have we ever shown contempt for your name? You've shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. And then you ask, well, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals who are crippled and diseased? Trying to give gifts like that to your, try, try to give gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. In other words, he's saying, if the governor was coming over, you'd probably break out your best. You'd probably break the bank and trying to show off a little bit. You'd probably be trying to bring it as, as like, like a whole different level than you normally bring. That's just the governor. What about me? I'm God. So verse nine, he says, Go ahead, beg God to be merciful to you. But when you bring that kind of an offering, why should he show you any favor at all? Ask the Lord of heaven's armies. How I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these kind of worthless sacrifices couldn't even be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And I will not accept your offerings. But my name is to be honored by people of other nations from morning until night. All around the world, they offer sweet incense and pure offerings in honor in my name. In other words, church, hear him on this. God is saying, if you're not going to do it, I'll find somebody who will. If you're not going to engage it, I'm going to find somebody who will. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of heaven's armies. 
But you dishonor my name with your actions by bringing contemptible food. You're saying it's all right to defile the Lord's table? You say it's too, it's too hard. It's too hard. It's too hard to serve the Lord. And you turn up your noses at my commands, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Think of it. Animals that are stolen and crippled and sick being presented as offerings. Should I accept from you such offerings as these, asked the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who promises to give a fine ram from his flock, but then sacrifices a defective one to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Wow. Now, this was back in the days when people would honor God and worship him by giving animal sacrifices to atone for their sins, okay? But are you picking up what God is laying down in the middle of all this? God is saying, when you worship me, a lot of you are coming into the room half-hearted, giving it a lot less than your absolute best effort, You're not giving your best focus. When it comes to giving and sacrificing, you're giving me the leftovers of what you don't need and what you can think away, uh, what what you think you can give away and not miss it, okay? When you leave worship, you don't obey my commands. You don't live like I've asked you to live. You don't do what I asked you to do. And it tells me, it tells me that you don't care about what I've given you. You don't care about what I've provided for you. It it tells me you care a lot more about you than you care about me. It's so interesting because God seems to talk about worship in relational terms here, doesn't he? It's, It's really interesting. At the end, he even tells the people. He just flat out tells them, I know my worth. I'm a great king. I'm the greatest good you're ever gonna get, okay? I heard a good friend of mine <clears throat> put it this way when he was talking to his church about worship a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago. He said, guys, I want you to imagine that it's Valentine's Day, right? And, and I want you to imagine that you tell your wife, hey, um, I didn't get you anything. Uh, I, I didn't make any reservations, didn't make any plans, you know, anything like that. Um, but, but I did save you a few slices of a pizza that I ordered last night. Okay. How's this going to go? Good or bad? It's going to go horrible, right? It's, <laughs> it's going to go horrible, right? If you don't bring your best to a Valentine's date, it's evidence that you don't really love your spouse as much as you think you might, right? Is that yeah, yes, that's true or no, it's not? Yeah, it is, right? Well, I'm here because I'm supposed to be. I mean, it doesn't really matter because it's just God. It's just church. It's all fake. It's all blah, blah, blah. Who who cares about any of this stuff? If you're going through the motions, what Malachi is saying is God knows that. He knows the difference between those two things. Remember, to be a follower of Jesus is to be in a love relationship with God. Jesus said the most important command is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if you're coming to church bringing God your leftover energy, and your leftover focus, and your leftover effort, and your leftover giving, and it's all your leftovers that you didn't really want and you weren't gonna eat it anyway. God says, it's like giving me some leftover pizza on Valentine's Day. Like, why'd you even show up for this at all? Worship is a relational thing, and how you worship is a relational statement. But it's not just a relational problem, it's also a positional one. And I'm gonna be really honest with you on this, okay? The church in America in 2024 has not helped you here. We haven't, okay? We, we have not been your friends on this because we've created a worship culture inside of the church that's based on a fatal flaw and a common misconception. Do you wanna know what it is? The common misconception is this. That God is up in heaven and the people up here on the stage playing the instruments and singing the songs and doing the things, they're the ones worshiping and I get to sit here and watch 
them worship or perform. I am a watcher, I am an observer, like I'm at a concert or I'm at a performance. We've turned worship into someone else's performance. We did that. The church did that. And you know what's so ironic about it? We did it in the name of trying to bring more people to church. We did it in the name of kind of saying, well, we we thought that if, if what was on the stage was better, then the church would be better and worship would be better. Now listen, we 100% strive for excellence in our worship in everything we do, in everything we do at Second Story. The band that was up here today, they led us so beautifully. It was so amazing. But listen, in terms of the culture that we bring to it and set for it, in terms of our expectations of it, we've turned the gym into a bodybuilding show. And then we wondered why people who are not advanced bodybuilders choose to not compete. It will kill your worship. It'll kill it dead when you think that God is just up in heaven, the people up here are the worshipers and performers, and I'm watching as an observer. Here's the reality and the positional flip that needs to happen in our minds, that God isn't up there, he's here. God is here, you are the worshipers, you are the ones worshiping, and God is the observer taking it all in. The folks up here are just people helping you lead into, lean into that experience. And when we really start to understand that, you really start to get into that, that wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. God wants to hear me sing? I don't want to hear myself sing. I don't want to hear the person next to me sing. I can tell you that for darn sure, right? Like, I, I, but God wants to hear me. God wants to me to give my best. God wants me to be the one who is in this equation, the active participant in this role, it changes everything because we leave on Sundays asking different questions, okay? Most people think that because someone else is the performer, that worship isn't a skill that I can improve at. Worship isn't a skill that I can get better at or mature at or get stronger in. But when I understand that I'm the participant, when someone asks you, how was church today? And and all of a sudden it flips it because most of the time we're going to say things like, well, I mean, the worship music was a little off and the singers were a little weird and there was this whole raising their hands thing. And I don't even know what that's all about. Then the pastor wouldn't shut up. just kept going on and on and on and on. Like we get into that mindset when they are the performers, but when you are the performers, we ask different questions. See, the real question you got to ask yourself when you leave today, it's not how did they do? It's not how did the pastor do? How'd you do? How'd you do? Did you give your best? Did you give your best effort to God because he's worthy of it and he got you through another week? So when you come to worship at Second Story, let's ask, what are some ways you can bring your best? Now, every church culture is different, okay? This isn't always necessarily universally true, but at this church, these are some things I would say that ways you can bring your best. We've got them up here on the screen. I'd encourage you to write these down here. The first is just be on time and be ready to worship. Hey, where were you at uh, 1130 today? For a lot of you, I know I wasn't in the room, right? Be on time, be ready. Get yourself here on time. Say hi to your friends afterwards. Go out to lunch with them. That's social time. This is worship time, right? Be ready to worship. Bring a mindset that says, I'm here to engage God. I'm here to thank him for what he's done. I'm here to declare my faith. I'm here to walk in something at a stronger level when I come out of here than I came in here walking at. I'm here to work out. Okay? Number two, sing. Don't just watch. I've, I've been on worship teams before. I've led with worship teams before. And, and can I just say a word to my brothers, the men in the room in particular? You have no idea how many men go through an entire worship set like this. Can't wait for this to be over. 
right? Like, and, 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 and again, in fairness, we don't always do you the most favors in this because sometimes, and I've talked with a couple of our worship leaders about this, and we're going to keep working it through and wrangling it through. Sometimes we do songs that are all about your feelings and your emotions and, oh, my heart and, oh, that, you know, I, I, I get it. I get it. I, I, I tend to refer to those kinds of songs as prom songs to Jesus, Okay. I don't, I, it's, it's hard for men to get into singing in worship when it feels like a slow dance song that I should be singing with him. So they, I get that. We're going to try to help you with this. Okay. We're going to try, but you have to engage. You've got to sing. You've got to not just watch it, sing it. How about this one? Raise your hands in worship or in prayer. And, and really what this is about, this isn't about a formula or, or a Uh, a desired behavior or something like that. This is about you allowing yourself to be moved. Okay? And and really what I have found it's about in my life is it's about you getting beyond your self-consciousness. Believe me, I get that. I'm six foot three and I sit on the front row. Like, I I get, if if I'm up there, I I know. I I know what that looks like and what it, I feel the eyeballs and all the kind of, but at the same time, I got to ask myself, why, why are you here, Seth? Are you here to worry about what people think of you? Or are you here because the only hope you had last week is the same only hope you've got next week? And that's God. So if that's the case, then get your mind off yourself and put it onto him. And it doesn't have to, you don't have to be all the way out there if that's just not a part of your tradition, not a part of your personality. You can start with things like, you know, hold the TV. You know, make it a widescreen, right? You've seen that, ten, yeah, that, that comedy bit where a guy names all the different ones, right? Like you've got, uh, you've got the raising the hand, the hatchet, or you can do the wave. Some people like to wash the window yes. when they're up there. You know, field goal, touchdown, all of that kind of stuff. You, yes. <laughs> there's different ways to do it. And some of them, yeah, I know it seems kind of silly, But the point is to try to enter into this in such a way that you're beyond your self-consciousness about it and really just taking a moment, even when we're repeating a chorus and you're like, man alive, how many times are we going to sing this line over and over again? Let the line wash over you. Let it sink into your spirit. How about this? Make your giving or your tithe the first thing that comes out of your paycheck, not the leftovers. (laughs) Did you know that the word tithe, I mean, it actually, it's another Malachi word, comes from that book of the Bible. It actually is a word that literally means 10%. 10% of the income that you get out of every 10 bucks, God says, put one back in my house so we can keep doing this. That's, that, that's what the tithe is. How about this? Take notes during the message. Be eager to learn. You know how many people over the years that I've sat in front of, Baptists in particular, I don't know why it's always Baptists, but when I'm in front of people and I'm getting a lot of, just staring back at me, stern, I could tell a funny story, could tell, a, uh, tell something that makes people laugh, <clears throat> they just sit there and they don't respond. They are like boulders and they will not be moved. Guys, come in here with a soft heart ready to learn. I'm not trying to get something out of you. I want something for you. Okay? We don't do messages because they're cute or amusing. We do them because opening up God's word changes people's lives. Okay? Talk back and encourage the preacher. Thank you. I was wondering. I was, I just, I was wondering (laughs) if someone would. No, listen, this is a big deal. Why is this a big deal? Now, again, different cultures, different, different shows of respect, Maybe we'll say it that way. But at the same time, I always tell people that if you want a better sermon, help me preach it. Get into it. Okay? If I feel like this thing is a balloon that's just letting out air all over you guys, then I'm just left with being the empty balloon at the end of it. Okay? The more you talk back and encourage your preacher, the better of a sermon you're going to get. And then finally, be ready to live it out when Sunday's over with a bare minimum of one action step. One action step. My friends, there is no point. There's just, it's no point in doing this on the weekends if you have no intention of living it out the rest of the week. It's just not. 
Come on, tell your neighbor, no more leftovers. Put it in the chat if you're watching online. No more leftovers. We're not giving leftovers anymore. And the final piece is this. I'm going to end on this. Follow the example of Jesus because other people are following yours. After Peter asked his question about how to respond, we're told that a cloud enveloped them and a voice spoke to them about who Jesus is. Verse 35, it said, Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. There's only, there's another place in the gospels where this happens to Jesus, where a dove descends on Jesus after he's baptized and a voice speaks and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. I need you to understand in both instances, when the voice of God says, listen to him, it doesn't just mean like take really good notes and be ready for the quiz. That's not what it means. It means that you need to take your experience of your relationship with Jesus and apply it to the rest of your life. Follow him. Learn from him. Get to know him. Spend your time with him. Make the way he taught you to live your new way of living. Peter wanted to know, Jesus, now that I see it, How should I respond to the revelation of your glory up here on the mountain? You remember how this story started? Peter, you were sleeping when you should have been listening to what Jesus was saying about the cross. Well, now he's not just talking about the cross. He's going to go live the cross. He's going to take the cross onto himself. He's going to exit this world, and it's all coming into motion now. We're going from this mountaintop onto Jerusalem, and Peter wants to know, hey, Jesus how do I do this? What do you need from me? And God tells him, Peter, here's the movement you need to learn. It goes from arms down, unresponsive, to reaching out like you're reaching for him, to arms opened up like this. That's what I need you to learn how to do. Because when you open up your arms the way that my son is about to open up his arms for you as they put him on that cross, that's the response to me that I need you to learn in your life. I need you to die to self in him so you can be raised to new life with him in every area of your life. All of it. That's your response. I need you to learn that motion because things that are too heavy for you to lift with your shoulders are things that I'm putting onto his. I'm putting them on him. He has the strongest shoulders the world has ever seen. I need you to learn this motion so you can get stronger as you carry your cross. Because it's in your weakness that you're going to find that you're strong. And that's where you're going to find you are most at home following him. You know why? Because it's the only way you're going to be strong enough to carry the calling I have on your life. And it's because it's the only way that other people who you're not even going to be aware of are going to watch you lift up the burdens that you have in your life. You have no idea who's watching your example while you take on that motion. You have no idea who's learning from you how to put their shoulder into their burdens and into their problems. It could be your kids. It could be your spouse. It could be somebody in your family. Maybe somebody's watching you from across the room in a worship service who's saying, I have got to figure out how to get shoulders like that guy. I have got to figure out how to put my shoulders into it like that woman. They are doing things that are lifting weights that they are carrying in their lives. And I don't even know how they got that strong. I just know that they're out here worshiping. And if God wants for us to learn that motion in following Jesus in it, it means that if you want to learn to worship, you need to learn to take what's too heavy for you and your shoulders and place it 
onto his. What does that look like for you today? Well, what do you need to take more seriously than you've been going through the motions on? What do you need to stop giving God the leftovers about? What's something that you can do on the weekends when you come to worship service? Just a couple of things you can think of that you could do to be more surrendered, less self-conscious, more of a participant than an observer. Ask yourself these questions this week. These are good questions to ask. But if what God says is true and the answer is The answer to the question of how do I worship better, it's to listen to his son. I want you to watch him. I want you to learn from him. I want you to live like he taught us to live. Then that means something. That means that worship is more than what happens on Sunday mornings. More than what happens on the weekends. It's about integrating what happens on the mountain to what's happening in the valley of the rest of your life, including learning to worship when you're hurting learning to worship when you're scared, learning to worship when you're sad and depressed and grieving, learning to worship when you're anxious, learning to worship when you're wounded and you don't feel like it. How in the world do you do that? We're going to start talking about that next week. We're going to spend two weeks talking about how do we take these elevated expectations, turn them into more full participation and live a life of greater integration. How can we do that? So we're gonna start that conversation next week. Will you come back for it? Will you come back for it? All right, I'll be here. We're gonna talk it through. Let's stand as we close today. And as we close out, I'm gonna pray for you. But as I do, here's what I want you to do. To the extent that you're comfortable, I want you to raise your arms, even if it's just here to here. Not just like you're going to receive something from God, but like you're releasing something onto the shoulders of Jesus that you cannot lift anymore. And we're going to worship him today by reminding ourselves that he alone can bear the burdens that take us out. So Jesus, as we come to you today, we ask that you would take the weight off of our shoulders so that we can lift our hands higher in praise, but also so that we may die more to self, that you might be more known in our lives, that your glory may shine through us. Father, my friends are here today, and there are a lot of them are struggling in their situation. There are things that are on their shoulders that are weighing them down, whether it is their past, whether it's their future, whether it is some job or work-related situation, whether it is some personal situation, whether it's a financial situation. God, these are things that are weights that are too heavy for us to bear. So help us by showing us how to die to self and release them to you, knowing that we are loved and that your grace covers all of it and that you will teach us how to live inside of those burdens, releasing them to you each and every day. Thank you for your grace that gets us through. And I pray that the worship that happens in this space with these people, with me, might be worship that someone else might see and say, how do I get stronger like that? How do I lift burdens like that so that we can remind them together? We aren't the lifter of burdens. Jesus is. We pray these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.